good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's my pleasure um, on behalf of OSFAM, International OSFAM Regional Office, OSFAM Africa, and the Women's International Peace Center to welcome you to this parallel event on women, peace, security, and the Maputo Protocol at 20 years. Why are we having this session? Maputo is 20 years, WPS is 20 plus, all the other frameworks are 20 years plus. In the past 20 years, we've had a vibrant women, peace and security movement. We've also had a vibrant Maputo protocol movement, but we seem to be working in silos. While a lot of the provisions uh, fall within women's rights, peace and security, we've not been able to converge and find a way to push the women peace and security agenda using Maputo protocol. And we think, after 20 years, since for this to be done better, as a continent, as a continent, we are faced with various forms of conflict. In fact, Africa is a theater of conflict. That doesn't mean there's no conflict in other parts of the world. But ours has been dominated by weak governance, issues of corruption, poor election management, emerging issues, including climate crisis, online abuse, violent extremism, marginalization of different groups of people in our different countries. And, you know, the fact that women in Africa also continue to experience different kinds of violation, but particularly, women who are living in conflict and post-conflict settings. While we do acknowledge that conflict impacts on everyone, we also know that its impact on women and girls is different and is not similar to other groupings. But within this group of women and girls, there's also uh, differences based on um, ethnicity, religion, culture, age, also makes women to experience violence in different ways. So today we want to listen and hear from the field of WPS and Maputo Protocol, what we can do best to begin to engage with these two instruments together. But we want to hear voices from the field in terms of how women who have experienced election violence, women who are experiencing violence now, uh, women who are living in post-conflict settings are experiencing their rights and how Maputo Protocol could provide an avenue for us. So I have a fantastic panel with me this afternoon. So I do promise you vibrant conversation. We are going to try to be as interactive as we can. So I'm just going to share who is on the panel. I'm going to start with my, with my sister over there, Dr. Hannah Foster, who is the executive director of the African Center for Democracy and Human Rights Studies. She's a human rights governance, gender and conflict transformation expert. And if any of us has a, engaged with Maputo Protocol or the African Human Rights Commission, we will know Hannah Foster. She's going to be speaking to us um, in this panel. The other person we have is my sister from Sudan, who is sitting next to her, uh, Nehal El Sheikh. Uh, she's a human rights activist. Um, who has so many years of experience in the nonprofit sector. She's a graduate of economics and social studies, uh, but she also has postgraduate diploma in international relations from the University of Khartoum. She's the founder of Feminist Library Initiative. So she has, and the program officer of Human Rights Hub, 
based in Sudan. She's currently here fleeing from the conflict in Sudan. So she's going to be sharing with us her experience. Next to her is my sister, Catherine in Jeru, uh, who works for the Office of the Special Envoy on Women, Peace and Security at the African Union. She has been driving the Women, Peace and Security agenda in Africa. She has been training us civil society and government on how to use the Continental Resort Framework to monitor the implementation of the Women, Peace and Security agenda. She was part of those who developed the framework, so she understands it. She has uh, been writing the reports on how African countries are implementing the WPS agenda. And we want to be listening to her in terms of how we can connect both frameworks, the Women, Peace and Security framework and the Maputo protocol. We'll hear from her. The next person is my sister, um, Josephine Chanduru, who is the executive director of Steward Women in South Sudan. So when I say my sister, it's because me too, I'm partly from South Sudan. Hey, I'm an East African. <laughs> She, she, she works on promoting the rights of women who have suffered sexual violence in Sudan, in South Sudan, South Sudan, in South Sudan. And she has been a champion promoting for the domestication of Maputo Protocol in South Sudan. So I think today when we were dancing, you could have seen her jumping. And it's been a long story to get South Sudan to domesticate the Maputo Protocol, ratify. to ratify. So they ratified. They ratified, they didn't uh, deposit. Eh? And then we pushed them and finally they took it. So she's going to be sharing with us what does it really mean to live in these situations? How has it been promoting the rights of women without Maputo Protocol? How will Maputo Protocol then be used? you know, to continue to promote women's rights. And just beside me here is my sister from Kenya. You see how inclusive we are. Jacqueline Mutere, if you don't know her, then you don't know anyone in Kenya. <laughs> She's the director of the Grace Agenda, and she tells me, I founded this organization based on my personal experience. When you work on a particular issue because of your personal experience, you work with passion. It's different. So we are very happy. She's going to be sharing with us her experience with election violence, the work she has been doing, and what lessons she sees in terms of how Maputo Protocol, the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda, has supported the work of women who have experienced uh, violence during elections and she would also be articulating some recommendations for us in the other regions. Online, we are going to have Lizio Kumalo, who is going to be joining us um, from South Africa. She has conducted ext extensive research in African countries around sexual and gender-based violence. She's done training for the military. And she, she has a lot of experience in terms of documenting sexual violence in, in, in conflicts and in other contexts. So this is the panel. I'm going to start with Catherine. We, we talk a lot about, um, and she can tell us, we've said 44 countries in Africa have ratified domesticated, which one are we using? The Maputo Protocol. But we also have like 35 countries that have also national action plans on the implementation of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. So when we go to all these other places in the other world, we boast of being the continent with the highest number of national action plans. But when we look at what is happening to us on ground, we are like, okay, we are very good. Uh, my sister from Nigeria said yesterday that we are very good at rushing to, to, to put policies in place, but the challenge is implementation. So I want Catherine to share with us 
being that we have so many countries in Africa who are in that, that are in conflict in the Sahel, in the East African region, in Southern African region, Mozambique, in the Sahel, in Nigeria, in Mali, Niger, hmm? DRC, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Sudan, South Sudan. How can we make the connection between Maputo Protocol and the Women, Peace and Security Agenda? Speaking as someone who has been monitoring the implementation. Over to you, Catherine. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Helen. And uh, also to you and uh, the organizers of this uh, panel to invite us to this uh, crucial and important discussion and also to my fellow panelists. First is to congratulate the you for organize this is the first time I'm hearing in the in the in the in the international forums trying to connect Maputo Protocol and Women Peace and Security Agenda, which is excellent, which is commendable. And I really want to commend you for that. So as you've been told, my name is Catherine Gero. I work in the office of the Special Envoy on women, peace and security. Madame Bintandiop, maybe most of you here know her, and uh, greetings from her. So I will not, uh, I will try to make it very simple. <laughs> I will not go to the text because these are both legal, they are written with a legal background and with a legal um, language, but I'll try to make it very simple for all of us. And I'll start by giving a simple background of what is, um, I mean, what is the background of the two documents? I think when we talk of women, peace, and security, which I'm calling the women, peace, WPS in the, in the presentation, it's women, peace, and security agenda, which today is formed of nine resolutions, I think 10, with the mother of them being resolution 1325, which we know very well, and also the Maputo Protocol of 203, which the two of them have been regarded as groundbreaking. And why are they groundbreaking? Because for instance, when you look at the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, Resolution 1325, it was the first resolution that accounted for the roles and the suffering of women in conflict situation and also called for the highest body that uh, looks at the peace and security in the world, the UN Security Council, to center issues of women at that level. And now when you come to the protocol, Maputo Protocol, it is the first um, AU framework that provides comprehensively for the rights of women in Africa. And therefore they are very, um, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are great tools and it's very important that we combine them when we are talking about the two agendas because they provide for women rights and uh, a promotion of women economic rights in conflict and also in post-conflict uh, con context. I like simplifying the one women, peace, and security by asking us to reflect what does peace mean for you as a woman? If we try to interpret what peace means for us as individual women, then we will see that peace is everything that we do. It's about housing, it's about education, it's about economics, it's about food security, it's about climate, it's everything. And therefore, in that context, then we have to look at what are the missing links of all these issues that are affecting women in a particular country, in a particular context. Therefore, I also like emphasizing that the Women, Peace and Security Agenda is not only for countries that are in conflict or in post-conflict, but for all countries. Because when you look at the issues of housing, do we have any African countries that have profounded housing for women fully? If you look at climate change now, if we look at education, have we reached parity for girls and boys in education? No not in any African. So all countries, and I like making it very clear that all countries in Africa, really, we need the Women, Peace and Security Agenda because when we interpret peace broadly, then women are, all those issues affect women. So the two tools, I see them as very great tools to uh, push forward on women's rights and ask our governments to comply with those provisions because especially for Maputo Protocol, which countries that are ratified are legally bound by what they have uh, uh, committed to. So uh, the Women, Peace and Security Agenda mandates all of us, African governments and also 
parties into conflict to promote women's participation and also protection during armed conflict. And that is really broad. But then the Maputo Protocol profines us with the how, because the resolution is not doesn't profine specific actions to be taken, but the Maputo Protocol profines specific guidelines on what needs to be done for every right that the Maputo Protocol profines for. And therefore, it I mean, slide two, whoever is uh, putting slides down. So therefore, whoever, whenever we are asking our governments to draw national action plans or to implement issues on women, peace and security, we need to mirror with what is provided with the Maputo Protocol because it's all comprehensive. But fortunately, because the Maputo Protocol applies to countries that have ratified, and Africa we have done very well, 44 of them have already ratified Maputo Protocol, which means those who have not ratified, they are not bound to it. But since provisions in the Women, Peace and Security Agenda relate to what is in Maputo Protocol, it means countries that are in conflict and have also not ratified the Maputo Protocol, we can use the Women, Peace and Security Agenda to reach to them, including our sister country, Sudan. So, I mean, I, I just want to bring that connection. So they are very much uh, connected and they reinforce each other. They help one tool to reach a, an area that the other tool is not reaching. But specifically, Maputo profi uh, Protocol provides the specific benchmarks of what needs to be done by governments on the minimum. So in terms of do do domestication, how have our countries performed? For Maputo Protocol, we are doing very well. We are 44 out of 55 countries. So only 11 countries that have not ratified Maputo Protocol. And that is huge enough. So that we can go to all these 44 countries and tell them, hey, you have committed to the right to peace for women. Because I mean, Maputo Protocol is the only uh, protocol that provides for rights to peace for women. Other, uh, even UN documents do not provide for that. So, and this means that the 44 states are bound by its provisions and therefore we can go strongly and boldly to them say, we have committed to this, we have to do it. In terms of uh, national action plans, we are less. We have 35 countries with the national action plans. And some of the 35 have also not ratified Maputo Protocol, which means uh, those who have uh, uh, ascended to the, to, to the Women, Peace and Security Agenda through a national action plan, then we can also hold them accountable to some provisions in the Maputo Protocol. An example is Burudi. I don't know whether we have anyone from Burudi here. Burundi is now in the third phase of the National Action Plan, but they have never ratified Maputo Protocol. So I'll try to speak specifically because the Women, Peace and Security has about four pillars. The pillar for participation, uh, the pillar for protection, the pillar for prevention, and the pillar for relief and recovery. I'll try to show connections in those areas and see how then can we use Maputo Protocol to move the agenda forward. And I'll try to be a bit quick. So in the participation pillar, who is scrolling down? So the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, one of the greatest provisions is the right for women to participate in peace and security processes. And that is very big. It means our, our women organizations given the space to push for peace building activities. When you are doing, um, uh, when we are, for countries that are in uh, peace uh, processes, are women participating in, 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 in Sudan, for instance, in Mali, for instance, and in all other conflict countries, are women participating in peace processes? So this is one of the greatest provisions that the Women, Peace and Security Agenda provides for. And then the Maputo Protocol tells us how because the 1325 doesn't say how, it just talks of women participation in governance, in peace processes and all this, doesn't tell us how. But the Maputo Protocol says how, and actually I like Article 10 and Article 9, which talks of uh, the need to promote women participation at local, at national, at regional, at continental, and at international level. That means your government has an obligation for you to tell us how many women is it pushing to be at the UN 
organs, you know, the organs that promote peace and security in the world. Is your government pushing women for those positions? At the national level, are we having women in the institutions that uh, provide for peace and security, the military, the police, the judiciary, the parliament, the cabinet, all these structures are women participating. And not only there, at the local level, where we have local councils, elders, now we have elders that are both women. At the local level, are women participating in the community peace building dialogues or are they not? But not only on peace processes, but also on governance, governance of climate issues, governance of resources, any governance. So, and that is very profound and it's one area that both Maputo Protocol and the Women, Peace and Security agree. And the Maputo Protocol, as I said, it provides us the guidelines how to do it. So um, what I also like about the Maputo Protocol, it's under Article 12 to 23, it provides for economic, socioeconomic rights that sometimes make women not be able to participate. I don't know who would be here if their families are don't have food or don't have housing. Would we be able to come for this meeting? So it calls for social protection of women and economic rights for women by ensuring that women go to school, women are educated, and women are living in a healthy environments, have housing and all that. So those barriers that make women not to participate, the Maputo Protocol provides for them. And therefore it gives women a tool to push them from the lower candles to higher levels of participation. So, but then the other area of the women, peace and security is the protection. Protection and the main day in the women, peace and security, we have emphasized protection from gender-based violence. But I want to clarify that we talk of protection of women rights and there are many. When we start counting women rights, there are many. And also not only protection from women rights, of women rights, but also protection from violence, including gender-based violence but also including socioeconomic harms, you know? So, and again, as I said, the Maputo Protocol then provides a structure on how, which are these rights and how do we do them. And when we look at article from article three to article 13, these are all socioeconomic rights, you know? It calls for right to dignity, security, protection from harmful practices. And I think on this, it was mainly on this FGM, female genital mutation, a window inheritance. I mean, Pro Maputo Protocol is very, very practical to the Af institutions of the women in Africa. So it protects women from violence, but also protects women from economic harms, you know, lack of housing, lack of food, lack of uh, proper environment and all that. And, and so it's, I find it very comprehensive. Um, but also very important is that Maputo Protocol provides for constitutional protection of women which is very important for countries that are going post uh, conflict uh, or those who are revising their constitutions to ensure that constitutional provisions are mirroring or are providing for women's rights in the constitution. And this calls for us to ensure that uh, when all um, laws are being formed, we are reviewing them against the Maputo Protocol. It's are the laws that we have in our countries providing for what Maputo Protocol has. And one of the things I like is the inheritance rights, the marriage rights, the education rights, even rights to participate in development, including ICT and all these things. So, and also this is part of what the Women, Peace and Security calls for. And another great one is that both UN Security Council Resolution 1325 calls for organizing for peace. It gives women power to organize for peace and it calls for women's peace initiatives to be supported, you know? We have women actually and women organizations, they always do peace work at track three and track two, but we are never reaching track one where the high level discussions are being held. So the two uh, frameworks recognizes the need for women to be supported and to be engaged in, this, in, in the participation in, in, in peace building processes. And Article 9 and Article 10, which is the article on the women's right to peace and the protection of women in conflict situations, provides a great framework on how to do this. But also Article 2, which is on uh, the removal of discrimination, 
provides for all policy frameworks, all policies that a government must do, must have a gender uh, lens. And therefore, that is enough to ensure that uh, women issues are engaged in every policy making level. I'm almost <coughs> concluding <coughs> because I'm also coughing. <laughs> So the, the, the other area that really we are not doing well is rehabilitation, reintegration, and construction. When we have now moved beyond conflict and we are reconstructing the countries. So um, how are women engaged at this level? How are they protected at this level? And we realize that the Women, Peace, and Security calls for protection and of women's special needs, you know? And not only women of special needs, but even during rehabilitation, reintegration, and post-conflict reconstruction, you know, the economic situation of post-conflict countries, how is it featuring issues of women? How are rehabilitation, when you are rehabilitating communities, are women even engaged? And again, as I said, the Maputo Protocol and Article 10 provides a course for that whenever we are planning all these things, the peace processes, for instance, uh, the economic framework that uh, governments will formulate and the laws and the policies, are they including issues of women and especially as they relate to their uh, specific needs? And it also, Article 10 and 11 provides for protection of asylum seekers, refugees, returnees, and displaced persons. And Sudan, really, we need to help the women of Sudan to, to, to access this. I'm told it has been brought to our attention that those who are going for refugee seeking in uh, Egypt, now they're having a lot of problems. And these are areas that we can now start applying these, um, these, these provisions in our, in our, in our, in our frameworks. <clears throat> so they say what is not measured, it's not uh, looked at. If, if I know my boss will not ask me on something, then I may not work on it. So, uh, but luckily the Maputo protocol is a framework that provides for monitoring and governments are supposed to report every two years, but the reporting is very, very, very poor. Women, peace and security do not provide for an accountability mechanism, but uh, it now continents or different organs have become very creative, including the African Union. We now have a monitoring and evaluation framework for uh, which you call the Continental Resource Framework for countries in Africa to report on how they are performing on women, peace, and security. But even before then, the Maputo Protocol helped us to hold governments into account on what they are doing in the women, peace, and security. The challenge is that we never, so, for so long, we have not seen the Maputo Protocol as a tool for peace building. And there we've not been able to help our countries to report on those issues uh, moving forward. So yeah, but now to say that we are aware of it, first of all is to ask our even government's reporting. I saw Kenya reporting, I am from Kenya, so I'm quoting Kenya, reported in 2021, I guess. And only 17 countries have reported by the year 2020, so which is really something not good. So we can start holding our governments accountable to whether even they are reporting on um, a Maputo protocol. So in conclusion is to say that uh, by referencing the Maputo Protocol, which again is largely accepted as an African tool, you know, when you some people contest 1325 as a foreign agenda, but the Maputo Protocol is African driven, it's African, uh, focuses on African countries, it's an African instrument. So if we use it to push for women, peace and security agenda, then uh, we can be, uh, it provides us a ground and also a credibility. So again, Maputo Protocol provides specific measures on how women, peace, and security can be applied in practice. And there it's very good for us to familiarize with it. And therefore, when you are developing national action plans or when you are revising them or when you are discussing, we need to bring them together and inform our actors, our governments, and everyone. So thank you so much, Helen, and the team for, for listening. Uh, thank you so much, Catherine. Uh, for giving us that very informative section. Um, I like when you said that the Maputo Protocol provides for uh, peace, a uh, framework for peace, and the fact that we need to define peace from the perspectives of women. But you gave us some of the things that Maputo Protocol does that the WPS framework doesn't do. For example, you said, 
Maputo is legally binding. 1325 is not legally binding. The Maputo protocol provides guidelines. WPS doesn't give us any guidelines. We have to tease it out ourselves. But you also said some of the similarities. Um, the other, the other difference is that Maputo provides for accountability and reporting. WPS doesn't give us that, and it's one of the weaknesses of the WPS that we can hold governments accountable. Uh, it's a bit, but it's also a strategy not to be accountable. But you do say that both of the frameworks have women's rights in the context of conflict, post-conflict, and so-called peace contest. And I'm wondering which country is in peace in Africa, if we all define what peace means to us. But also, both have called for women's peace initiatives to be supported, which is true. And you have said that Maputo could be used as a tool for peace building. I'm not going to build on that last statement to ask my sister, Anna Foster, who has been one of the <laughs> uh, mothers, mothers of, <laughs> of Maputo Protocol, and say, Catherine has given us these different frameworks. She can see it very clearly. I too am seeing it, that Maputo has what it takes for us to push for the women, peace and security agenda. As a human rights activist, and as someone who was in the process, who is, was in the initial processes of developing the Maputo protocol, how do you think uh, women's rights organizations, um, women human rights defenders in Africa can use Maputo to advance the WPS agenda? based on your experience. I'm going to give you uh, eight minutes. I noticed I didn't give uh, Catherine uh, because she was doing some kind of framing for the conversation. So now she has given it to us. We, we can now do something very fast. Seven minutes, madam. Thank you. I said thank you very much, uh, Madam Moderator, for giving me this opportunity. I said I had a whole presentation, but I'll try to just tease out some of the points so that uh, when the discussion comes, uh, we, we might be able to pick out the other ones. Um, my brief had asked that I also look at the human cost of conflict, and um, that's imposed on me the need to find out, are we at peace in Africa? And uh, we, you, even looking at just West Africa, you find out that when you talk about Burkina Faso, yes, there are problems. You go to Guinea, there are problems. You go to Mali, there are problems. You go to DRC, you go to Cameroon. And then you ask yourself, uh, is it because war is good, is it because conflict is good that they are copy, they, we have copycats? You go to Sudan, you go to South Sudan, and the latest is Sudan because they, uh, there is a lot of fighting going on. There is a lot of uh, people killed. There are a lot of people injured, and you ask yourself uh, if these things are negative and does not help development. Why is it that it has become the trend uh, for uh, states to encourage? war because some of these are within interstate and they are being encouraged by the state itself. So I asked myself, why is this happening? Is it because we feel that we want to show each other how our muscles are? It's, it's, it's one, wonderful that um, we've seen war. We thought the uh, colonial days would have taught us that we need to make sure that we uh, our brothers keep us but it's not working. So when we talk about the human cost, we try to attach economic uh, cost to it. And uh, in one of my sources, it tells me that um, we are looking at over 11, 18 billion uh, per year dollars that we should have been using in uh, development that we are now using 
to buy our arms and to make sure we kill each other. The other thing that I wanted to highlight is the fact that the microeconomic cost of conflict is generally very large with GDP per capita of 28 um, higher. Yes, 28% higher. And uh, if you look at those that uh, are not, those not those affected, uh, you find out that it's 41%. And 10% of the most peaceful countries, you find out that their GDP is 3.9%. So if you look at yourself and you say, okay, I want a better life. I want a peaceful life for uh, my, um, my citizens. It is better to keep peace. It is better to make peace. But then how do we make peace? I was looking at uh, both the, um, the Maputo Protocol and the, um, the 1325. The 1325 is beautiful, beautifully written and all the other related, uh, <laughs> all the other related resolutions. These are resolutions, like um, my sister has already said. And uh, the Maputo Protocol is binding on states. Perhaps what we might need to do is to continue with that comparison. Yes, uh, we would say that, uh, okay, Article 10 and 11 speak expressively to, expressly to uh, conflict and the right to peace, the right to participate and all, all those other things. But then I believe that to make it work, we need to look at the other articles and see how and what impact it can make uh, in creating life for citizens. And by that, I mean, I'm looking at Article 2, non-discrimination. Yes, because uh, if people, citizens, are able to live in a, an environment with no discrimination, then that makes the life of the woman better. We are talking about gender-based violence, okay? And when you look at uh, Article uh, 4, it's talking about the right to life, integrity, security, you know? But <laughs> my sister, uh, Jackie, will tell us that these are not things that happen once in a blue moon. It, and it has taken root. When you look at COVID, during COVID, the statistics that, that came out is not something we are proud to write home about. So look at women human rights defenders and even civic space you find out that these also add another layer of um, insecurity and instability in most of our countries. I want to also highlight Article 3, the right to dignity. Do we know about uh, how to maintain uh, that dignity of the person which commits states to adopt and implement uh, appropriate measures to prohibit exploitation? Now trafficking is... <laughs> is the, the, the order of the day. The other time I was, um, I think it was when I was coming here, we saw a lot of lovely ladies and gentlemen, and all of them have been given visas to go where? To the Gulf, to look for money. And some of them, I, I re also read somewhere, some of my Kenyan sisters who have not even been able to return because they came back, they've been overworked, they've been oversexed. And you, you find out that it's, it's, it, you know, it's very disheartening when, when, when you think about it. Then you look, about article, look at Article 9, and Article 9 also is very in, in important because it's talking about uh, participation in decision-making and all those other things. <laughs> How many... Uh, potential uh, candidates, women candidates, have been given the rights of, uh, of passage. How many? And some of them are facing hate, hate speech. They are facing, uh, um, in, in, they are being abused in the internet. Some of them are being beaten. Even in Gambia, we've seen women candidates who've been beaten up. 
And this all, when you quantify all of this, you know, when the, the energy of those people should have been used to develop the country, <laughs> it's disheartening that it adds a lot more to uh, what we are doing. So I want to just highlight the fact that, um, yes, we should also think about how we come up with gender sensitive political and conflict analysis. We have statistics, but the data, sometimes you find out that it's conflicting. How do we make sure that we get our statistics right? I think that is one thing we, also, we need to put on our agenda. The other one is promoting inclus inclusion of women meaningful participation in all peacemaking and peace building. It's there. Resolution 1325 has it. But Resolution 1325 is, is the older sister of Maputo Protocol. But then have we achieved the goals that we've set? It's problematic. So, Women's participation in the electoral process <laughs> remains a dream. And uh, there are other things. I want that... you to hold it there. Yes, but thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Hannah. Thank you. Can we appreciate Hannah, please? I want to pick from where she stopped. That's because she can talk for the next two hours. <laughs> I know her very well. So we want to move from policy to practice. What is happening on ground? And we have three different countries. One that has Maputo Protocol, the other that have just come in, and the other that doesn't have, all in the context of different kinds of conflicts in Africa. So building on where Hannah stopped in terms of election violence. I don't want to talk about the violence of women who participate in politics in different ways. She has said it. So I don't want us to dwell on that. All of us can be traumatized for the, for the rest of the day. But the issue is that women have been prevented from participating because of the nature of elections that we hold in Africa. Online intimidation, physical intimidation and threat for women candidates, women in political parties not being in any reasonable position. Okay, yeah, are we okay? Okay, yeah. You have to be very conscious. Um, you know, in these spaces. So I want to start with my sister, Jackie here, who is a Kenyan, who has experienced election violence in Kenya, whose experience from election violence has determined the path which she's working in terms of promoting women's rights. Jackie. So Kenya has Maputo Protocol. Hmm? But here, election has led to different forms of sexual violence and has impacted on individuals. And based on what Hannah has said, you know, Hannah, Hannah said the cost of violence in Africa. But she said something, and I wanted to report, you know, respond to her. Why? War is an economy. Until we begin to name and shame those who are behind our walls and providing us with weapons to kill ourselves and taking our natural resources, it may not stop. Those who are asking our government to spend more money on militarization of our countries and give us loans and reduce spending to social services and increase military spending, we have to start naming and shaming them so that they know we know what they are doing. So Jack, tell us what has been your experience. Has Maputo Protocol provided justice based on your experience, first your experience, and what did Maputo Protocol in Kenya do in the circumstance for you? Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And um, as you have heard, my name is Jackie. Uh, let me start off by first of all appreciating Hannah and uh, Catherine and what they have said about the Maputo protocol. And um, the most important thing being that 
via the, simply these policies. Because if we were to translate those policies, and, and Catherine very rightly said that um, Kenya reported, but I wonder what they reported. If I am sitting here to tell you that I'm one of the people who have who can rubbish everything that they reported. Um, I say that, and I say I speak in humility, and I'm not here to rubbish my government, but just to give you um, a very practical look on what actually happened. In two th I'm speaking about um, election-related sexual violence and how women actually, the billions that Hannah mentioned, those billions that are, are, are spent in war, actually plays out on women's bodies. That the cost of those billions, had they been put in peace processes, would make much more productive women than that which is cost on buying guns. And, but I'm saying this before that. In 2007, 2008, Kenya went through a process of um, post-election violence. And allow me, if I don't speak very gracefully, because the, the thoughts are just running in my mind. Uh, uh, so just allow me to, to speak. And um, the, the, the results were announced in, in December. In January, a war broke out. Let, we call it conflict, because they, they, they say that Kenya is, a, is a, a state of interest. It was not outright war but it is just conflict. And the conflict was because of disputed election results. And the, it spilled out and Kenya has never experienced that kind of violence before. So one of the key things um, that happened apart from the burning of houses, the IDPs, the, the, the impact of it being the IDPs, He was running from the police and he, um, he called out to me, so I know his voice, so I, and I allowed him in. And when he did, when he came in, um, I realized that something was wrong because of the way he entered in. I realized he was under the influence and we got into a battle, um, a, a scuffle. Um, of course, he ended, because he was bigger than me, he ended up raping me. So in January, that's, that's, that's the short version of it. In Jan that was January. In February, I realized I was pregnant. I want to tell you that I had just had a baby the previous year in July, and now it is February, and that other baby is six months. I realize I'm pregnant, but I'm pregnant through this rape. So I tried three times to have an abortion. The first time uh, I went to, um, uh, to uh, 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 a doctor, uh, can I call them a quack doctor? Oh. Because they were, it's just somebody who will do a procedure to ensure that the fetus does not continue living anymore. But I was unable to pay for it because at that time, my daughter had come back. And that's the time when Kenya had just uh, established a law for exams that any student who is a Form 4 student had to, you had to have a photograph. There were some new rules that had been in, um, instituted by, by the ministry. And so she had come back for that. And so the money that I had saved to do the abortion had to go through the, you had to go to the girl. The second time when I tried, um, the institution that I went to had been busted by police. So I actually I was just actually going into the doctors for a procedure. I saw the, the DO was there, the, the police were there. So that institution had been busted. So we were unable, I was unable to do it. So I just walked by like a normal person who just came to find out actually what's happening to this institution. Uh, well, what's happening here? Why is, why is there a crowd here? Why are there police? And they say, hey, the doctor has been taken. He's, he's guilty of doing this and that. I said, oh, I see. And I just walked away also like just another normal citizen. The third time I sat in the doctor's office, but at that time I was more than six months pregnant. And I sat in the doctor's office and he had gone for field work. Oh, he had gone for field work. And he told me to wait for him that he would do the procedure. So I sat in the office from about 10 o'clock, but by four o'clock he hadn't yet come because it was field work and we couldn't, I couldn't stop him. So I got tired of sitting in, in the office he had told me to hang on, but I couldn't hang on anymore. So I said, I'd do what? Uh, uh, I'd wait for him the, the maximum uh, time. By seven o'clock, he had not yet turned up. So I left. So I was very far gone. So my third, my, my that, that is attempt number three. Yeah. 
Okay, so then the last attempt was I went now, I decided to go to an institution that we have in Kenya here. It's called um, the Child Welfare Society of Kenya. And they have something called the mother offer. And a mother offer is you offer up your child. You say you do not want this child and um, you, you uh, at whatever cost. But there's a twist to that offer. They will take your child, but they'll only take your child after six, six weeks. After six weeks, which mother will give up a child? So it is designed actually to fail. It is designed for you to keep your child. So it's actually not really a, a, a strategy whatsoever. So, um, but I opened a file. Uh, I gave in my names, gave in the detail, gave in the details, and I told them to come to the office to um, to the hospital that I was going to have the procedure in, so that the procedure they can do. I didn't want to see the baby. I didn't want to do anything. I did. I didn't want to have anything to do with the baby. So I went to the hospital on that day, and for some reason, when I kept calling the officer to tell the officer that I'm going to have the child and can they come and take the baby, because I didn't want, I was actually going to abandon that child in the hospital, and. Uh, the, for some reason, that person, they, it was in what in Kenya we call Muteja. They're just unavailable. Um, the, the service, the, the owner of this service is not available on this number. And it went on until I went into theater. So uh, the only people who knew about my strategy for abandoning this baby were my brothers who were part of the plan. So I went into theater, came out, and uh, me, I knew my problems were over. So now knowing, knowing first of all, I, I have to tell you that by that time, my serious status had already changed. I have got a child who's doing exams. Okay, I'll, I'll collect it. <clears throat> I had a child who was doing exams. Um, I had the, um, three other children, uh, three other children in the house. And this other one was, uh, was uh, six months or so. So I went in and then I came out. So when I came out, I knew my problems are over. Things were beeping. I said, ah, this problem solved. Whatever happens, that is it. So for some reason, during, during when I went into theater, the, the change of shifts happened. So the sisters that I had done the deal with and together with my brothers changed shifts. They're under no obligation to tell anybody anything about anything. So they just left. So when I woke up, I was hearing a, a children crying. Of course, it's a maternity ward. Children should cry. And 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 uh, I just had a child crying, a very loud, loud scream, scream, a child crying, and I thought to myself, it just in my dozing, on a, you know, when you're coming out of of, um, of general anesthesia, you sort of you you go in, you come out, it's sort of a dreaming state. And I thought to myself, gosh, can those sisters take care of that child? That child is really, or can the mother breastfeed? Can somebody just do something about that child? And I turned at one point, and I found that that child that was crying was right next to me. And it was in the, the green hospital clothes. And um, I said, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Then I opened. And when I opened, she was, she was about 2.1 kilos, very tiny, because I didn't want to eat. I didn't want her. I didn't, do, I just did. She was so tiny, but she was the cutest, cutest, cutest little doll of a child. She is now 15 years old and a piece of work in my house. She is a darling, darling girl. I kept her. That's the long and the short of the story. I kept the girl. I kept the baby. And um, she was so beautiful. And I actually named her Princess. And then I named her after my mother. So she is Princess Benedict Jasmine. And I named her Jasmine because she was one of the most beautiful children. She has been one of the most trouble-free babies. One of the most, she's a, actually, she's a human rights defender. She brings home children who are unable, who don't have fees, children who, who don't have clothes, children who don't have lunch. She brings them home. She's really at the, one of the most compassionate children. But that's the good part of it. Now I'm, I've run 15, 15 years ahead of myself. Around three years into the recovery process, I thought to myself, who is going to speak for the pain? Oh, I need to tell you that immediately after I went, uh, after I had the baby, I went back into hospital one week later because I had acute septicemia, acute septicemia. And because of the cesarean section and because it, the, everything went septic from one side of my stomach to the other side. So I was literally rotting when I'm still alive. So I went in in November 12th. 2008. I came out in January of 2009 after having lived in hospital for three months, after having undergone three surgeries for debridement, 
for restitching, for rehabilitation, for transfusion, and uh, for, for psychological care. So when I came, now I stayed in hospital, but my baby stayed with my brother. So they had that, there was that anxiety and that separation. So I did not know what I was going to do. But one thing I remember, um, just before the final, the last, the last um, operation that I, the, the, that I had, that, that, that when I went to theater, because I'd been into three and I was so thin. I didn't, I was unhealthy. I had gone to, through, to, through two blood transfusion and I knew that this one, I just might not make it. And I just thought to myself, gosh, my children are so young. So I made a deal with God. And I said, God in heaven, if you live, if you're alive, just save me for my children. Just save me for my children. And I promise that with this story, what has happened to me, I promise, God, I promise that I will speak for women. I will speak for others who do not have a voice. I will speak for them. So I came out and I came out. Jackie, I want us to fast forward. Okay. That's exactly what I want to do now. Maputo protocol. Maputo. Maputo protocol. Maputo protocol. Maputo protocol in Kenya. Yes. Did it work for you? It did not work for me because all the reconstruction, the participation of women in these processes, the reconstruction of Kenya after the post-election violence did not involve, involve any single survivor. And we met with Catherine when she was still working at the commission. And she, said, she was still working on this agenda from that time. And um, the, the agenda of um, sexual violence survivors was a ticklish issue because it, all of it was um, based on who on, on, on something called the ICC process. So we thought, why not you, why, why not even use the um, Women, Peace and uh, the WPS agenda to advance our agenda because we wanted to be part, we, we the survivors wanted to speak and tell them about the, um, how, to, how to avoid, how to not go that direction. We wanted to tell them that the impact of war on our lives this is the cost of it. This is the cost of women's lives. This is the cost of the lives on their families and by extension, the communities. We wanted to tell them about what it costs in terms of discrimination to the communities that we live in and what, how, how, how it escalates into other things. We wanted to tell them that now after the violation, now that we are vulnerable, where do we reconstruct and re-strategize and strengthen our lives to restore the dignity that we once had before the violation? Where did that happen? Catherine, did I not come to your office severally? Mm -hmm. Several times. I tried. I tried as, a, as an individual. Then I realized that we, my voice was alone. So that's when I started Grace Agenda so that we can have the collective voice of women survivors from Kenya to participate in these processes. But like I said, uh, uh, but it, it became a bit difficult because now they also, because it was election related and it was politically related, it could not be handled like that at all. So they would have rather silenced our voices, silence our, um, um, our words, so that they do not have to deal with this process. Because each time, they'd have to reflect back on the cause of the politics. And they did not want to deal with that, with, with, with the cause. It was still a very sensitive issue until extremely very recently, when now they talked about the, the, um, there were a lot of um, activism around the Maputo Protocol, but there was just that clause on abortion, the access to abortion rights. That became a bit ticklish to Kenya. And I think it has been reviewed. And so now our constitution allows you, if your life is in danger and the life of the mother, um, um, uh, the life of the child is in danger, you are able to access that abortion. But I tell you, to get a doctor who will put their name on that paper to say, I agree that this mother's life is in danger, this child is in danger, that is going to be a tall order. Wow. Should I stop there? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Wow. If you listened to Kat, to Jackie, it started from the right to education for the girl child, the right to health, the right to reproductive health, the right to abortion, the right to dignity, the right to security. It's all these rights we've talked about. And the reason why we are saying intersectionality, you cannot deal with one right outside the other. It doesn't. But also the fact that reparations and justice for survivors of sexual violence in the context of elections 
is a problem in Africa. It's not only in Kenya. The silence around it, the shame that is associated. So I really want to congratulate you for speaking out because by, I, I honor you, by speaking out, you've enabled others to speak out. Otherwise they are like, uh, you know how, how they really humiliate you when you have been raped? And I really like the fact that you brought it out. Many times it's not strangers who rape us. It's people we know. Mm. You heard his voice. You know it. You opened the door. Somebody will say, why did you open the door to a man? But you know him. And there was violence. You thought he was in danger. Mm. So what crime did you commit other than helping a neighbor? Mm. But the other question is, you see this neighbor. And yet, they've not done anything to him. And he will go around raping more women. So thank you so much for the journey and for sharing with us. So I want to move to my sister from South Sudan, Josephine. We know, I know, because I have documented the experiences of women in South Sudan. Me, I know that women were raped. But as a South Sudan woman, you, you have made that your mission to promote the rights of women who have suffered from sexual and gender-based violence. How has it been for you working in this area in a country without laws, without Maputo protocol? But now we are, we are dancing eh? this morning. Even me, I danced. <laughs> now we have Maputo protocol. Is it going to change things for us? What can you do for, for your women in the work that you do? Jacqueline, you have seven minutes. Thank you, Helen. Hey, welcome um, back. <laughs> not yet. Sorry. I need to give Jackie a hug. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you. I read here yesterday, I've hugged, hugged, hugged. I feel warm even. I, I feel better this, now. This hug we hug yeah. as Africans, it's, it's really healing, mm. uh, sisterhood, mm. solidarity. It, it means so much. You know, COVID, <laughs> COVID took away many things from us, but we have claimed it back. Yeah, thank you very much, Josephine. Thank you for that story. And thank you, my fellow panelists, for joining me in the hug. Um, I'm Josephine. I work with Steward Women, an organization that is women-led and focuses on provision of access to justice for women and girls in South Sudan. I meet cases such as Jackie's every day, but every day is a new experience for me. Every day is a new experience for me. Dr. Helen said that there is rape in South Sudan, and I think you've heard that in the news. Myself sitting here as Jackie's lawyer and Jackie narrating that story is just a new experience for me. We have conflict-related sexual violence, in South Sudan, children born out of rape, children being called different names, children who do not know where their background is, and yet historically children are aligned with their fathers, and these fathers are invisible. We have SGBV, that is alarming with 57% of women facing that in South Sudan. And according to a UNFPA report that came out this March, 2023, South Sudan ranks the second 
with SGBV trends. We have harmful cultural practices such as wife inheritance, bride price, lack of property rights, high trends of child marriages, just to mention but a few. This was the background through which we looked forward to the ratification of the protocol. We were in all these. Remember we had a 2013 conflict, we had a 2016 conflict. To date we have intercommunal violence. And in all these situations, the violence does not fail. Even as we talk here, a woman is being violated somewhere. Violence has been used as a tactic of war. It is a war crime, we are aware about that. Genocide and crimes against humanity. So going back to Maputo protocol, we felt that with all these violations, we want to drive on the seat of accountability. We needed to ensure that there was accountability for survivors. But we didn't have a law that specifically protects women and girls in South Sudan. So we were like, do we go with Sexual Offenses Act? Do we go with the AGBV bill? Do we go with the, a family law bill? We don't even have a law on marriage, divorce, and succession to property. That is why when the man pays his heavy cows, you become his property. And at the domestic setting, he can do anything he wants to his property. And since you are property, you are not able to own property in his home because property cannot own property. So we came with this idea that what do we do for women to access justice? Accountability. Okay, we don't have law. What do we do? Let's begin the campaigns for the ratification of the protocol. We kicked this as a team in 2012. It took us a decade for the ratification to happen this year. Also, we were grappling with the issues of gender equality. In, the, in our transitional constitution, you know, um, Helen usually says that South Sudan has terminologies that doesn't exist anywhere. Transitional constitution, revitalized peace agreement, huh? transitional government of national unity. Where do you find such terminologies in South Sudan? So equality as a principle is there stipulated in the constitution, the transitional constitution. But do you also know what the con transitional constitution of South Sudan says? That customs and traditions are sources of law in South Sudan. So if customs that are oppressing women through harmful practices are now a source of law in South Sudan. How can women realize peace? How can we fight violence when this is now constitutionally, re uh, this is a constitutional mandate that customs are laws of South Sudan. So we said, okay, I think we need to still ride on the horse of Maputo protocol and ensure that even as we ride on the horse of Maputo protocol, we are going to have a new constitution, a permanent constitution in place that customs and traditions should be removed there because of the conflict that it will cause. So because of customs being part of the, uh, the laws of South Sudan, we, we saw many women we are going to traditional courts to seek justice, leaving alone the statutory courts. And also women preferred traditional courts because they are accessible, they are nearer. They, despite the challenges that women face before the traditional courts, statutory courts were a 
expensive. Women, we are not so much about the legal processes that take place in the statutory courts. We said we have a lot of work to do. Still, Maputo Protocol is the way to go. Under Article 10 of Maputo Protocol is the right of women to peace. I think, um, your name? Catherine talked about that extensively. For women, what does it mean to have peace? Peace is when you are free from violence, you are free to transact your businesses, and you are free to do whatever you want as a woman. So how can women realize peace if they are not participating in the peace processes? Women decided that they will begin to include themselves. When Helen was there, women forcefully included themselves in the peace processes. Sometimes they are excluded from those closed door discussions. But even with that, women pushed for, a clear, there was a clear agenda that women representation will be realized with 35%. We all know here that Beijing platforms set the critical mass that the percentage should be 30%. South Sudan women went ahead and said we need 35%. So we realized this 35%. And okay, during peace process, peace agreement was given to us coming to implementation. Women, we started with appointments, government started with appointments, but do you know what happened? We reached, I think, up to 30 something percent. And then after a few days, they started removing these women and replacing them with men. A recent example is the Minister of Defense. She was removed and replaced with a man. We need to do work on the protocol. The protocol was not ratified and we are doing work on it and all these injustices were moving around. So what happened? In conclusion. In conclusion, we need political will. Without the political will to implement women's agenda, to implement the Maputo protocol that now we are entering into that phase, women's agenda, women's equality, and women's emancipation will not see the light of the day. Okay. Thank you so much. So Josephine said I was there. So when we were drafting the demands, we actually asked for 50%. Somebody said, let's put 35. I said they will reduce it to 25. Because the constitution says 25. You people, let's put 50. So that if they reduce it, we fall small. And that was what happened. Hey, how can they be demanding for 50? Look at these women. Hey, let's give them 35. So we landed 35. But we are still struggling to get the 35. Thank you very much, uh, Josephine. And uh, you talk about the issue of children born of rape, the issue of identity. I don't think there's any law that says these children belong to the mother. They say it belongs to the father who is invisible. So a lot of times there are men, there are boys who grow into men who really want identity, but the law does not provide anything for them, even the girls. So Maputo, does it consider those? Okay, so we move. We move to the contest where women are being raped now on the streets. I don't, I don't understand the relationship between a fight going on and other women raping, other men raping women. I don't understand it. I don't know if men understand it, but me, I don't understand it. Hmm? There's conflict. And the only thing you think about is raping women. Yeah. We still have to continue to study it. So my sister from Sudan, no Maputo protocol. No women peace and security mm. agenda. Mm? Mm -hmm. We were pushing. I know the national action plan was almost there. Then there was conflict. Then we have these transitions that are happening. Then there is this war that is now going on, which me too, I don't understand. Yeah. Whether it is us, it's other people, I don't know. 
Whether it's ego or it's power, I don't know. We are still trying to understand it. But all we know is that they have refused any intervention to listen to anyone. Uh, we say African solution to African problems. But the peace process is where? Outside Africa. Being called by leaders from outside Africa. What is their interest? We are still trying to understand. I'm not asking you, don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Me myself, uh, my I sister, have... we have to be safe from these things. Don't say anything. Yeah, yeah. Me, myself, I don't have the answers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we are just asking because those are the questions you yeah. want to understand. What is driving this? Yeah. You know. Yeah. So what is the current situation? Yeah. And what has been the impact on women of Sudan. And to life, we don't even start the conversation about it, the serious conversation about it in Sudan. So I wish it will be the way and first step to go forward. Um, the current conflict war, I'm always confused what the term I should use um, to describe exactly what is going on in Sudan. But I can start with the background of uh, the conflict. Uh, on the 15th of April, uh, the um, arm, the Sudan armed, um, sorry, the Sudan armed forces which is called SAF, and RSF, which is Rabbit Support Forces. It's a paramilitary. They start a serious series of uh, armed confrontation in the capital of Khartoum. And then uh, the fight is spread uh, to the all three main states in Khartoum and quickly spread to other states in Darfur region, Al Jinena, uh, Niala, Al Fashir, Zalinji. And it's still now, um, it's still the armed confrontation is taking place till that moment. So it's almost like three months since the conflict started. This all resulted um, in killing of thousands of people. And we don't even have like actual estimation of this. Um, and also it resulted of the displacement of 3 million people according to the IOM, which is the International Organization of Migration. Uh, people displaced across in Sudan to other safe states, including myself when I start to flee Khartoum, I flee to other states which is safer because no one can like choose to stay in Khartoum unless they don't have other choices or don't have other places to go. Um, most of the people uh, flee to the neighboring country, which is Uganda, Chad, and also Egypt and other um, countries. Um, the humanitarian situation and the impact of the conflict of war on women specifically, it's devastating because always women find themselves the most vulnerable group during the conflict time. And always women being the targeted as, um, and to use their body as a place of doing the war itself on their bodies. And um, there is also, there is no like, um, a specific estimation for, for, for the SGBV that took place since the conflict started, but there is many people do it individually. And also there is a unit, government unit called Combating Violence Against Women Unit. They reported 42 rape cases in Khartoum and 25 cases in Niala and other 21 cases in Aljinena. And those, rape cases were accused and committed by RSF, which is Rapid Support Forces, as survivors' testimonies. And what is really important to be mentioned here, this number is underreported way too much than the actual number. And that even based on the observation and even the normal chat and the normal talk between us as a citizen when we have it, 
we know that there is other many cases, but it's not still documented through the official channel, so we can like specify and say. And and when and that's lead like to realize that there is many reasons behind those cases not being reported uh, due to the social stigma and the social norms in Sudan. And I'm definitely sure we can apply this in most other African countries. And also the problem that people are reluctant to report it because no one saw any one of the perpetrators in the history of Sudan being accountable for what they being used. For example, like just if we are not talking about the past, we are talking just about the past four years since we started the revolution in 2019, in 2018, sorry. Um, while we are going out the street protesting and do everything, many of, many of the rape cases was being used by the military and RSF themselves because they were together at that time against the protesters to just use it as a tool to protect women to be participating in, in, in protests. Uh, because women participate in Sudan revolution largely and they were the backbone for all the protests. Um, and almost like we have many salugans that like state this revolution belonged to women because we are participating in it more than anyone. And and based on that process and the revolution and the protest and everything, unfortunately, when it came to women participation and women participated in negotiation with the military council, um, the other uh, political parties, which mainly, I would just use the term that they are patriarchal um, uh, part political parties, they always use a conservative narrative to argue that women shouldn't be a part of it, or we just should give them like a small percentage to be represented in the negotiation. And also, they always like, I remember that just, um, I don't remember the name, but I, I remember that one of the female participants during the negotiation, she said that the male fellows choose like very late time at night, which is make it hard for women to be part of the negotiation because their housework they have to do back at home and always be, and also because not safe. And it's not safe because the same reason that they are using it are you sorry <clears throat> are using it against them. Um, and also when it's come to women inclusion in peace talk or even in negotiation and everything, it's always been like we have to struggle and we should take a battle to achieve like our goals. And they always take a backwards when it comes to political participation, leadership position, and participating in negotiation. For example, um, in Juba Talks in 2020, women represented in the in the peace talk was 10%, 10% only. 10% from the entire talk about peace to bring peace for Sudan, which is obviously failed to bring peace to Sudan because now we are in war. Um yeah, I think um the woman inclusion, the the exclusion, it's always been a part of our struggle and our battle. We always have a, I, I really, when when you were talking about, we talking about the percentage, we had the same talk and we had the same battle. And even we designed a campaign and we had to prove that women are capable to hold this a certain position while men, they, they were just rewarded by the position. While we, while we were to do the hard part and bring all this resume about women and how they impressive and they, like we are trying to justify something, it's basically, it's one of our rights. It's not like we are asking for it. We deserve it because we work really hard for it. We participate on it. We died, we've been raped on the street. We did actually everything 
to lead us to the democratic transition to achieve what we want for our country, Sudan. And yeah, um, yeah, I think that's it uh, from my side. Uh, I look, uh, but regarding to your question, to the Mobutu protocol, I was thinking because I was listening to the whole experience, the one who ratified, the one who's still in the process, what you have been done so far. I think it could be for us an, as opportunity because there is a 20 years of work and experience and we did it in Star yet. So definitely we can benefit from all other experience and move from somewhere, which is make us in a better position, I think, based on our sister experience for sure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. Thank you, sister. welcome. And we always say it is research shows that countries that have experienced conflict uh, and are in the process of developing new constitutions and new laws to, from, to transit into democracy have a better chance of including gender or having gender responsive policies, constitutions. So I think it's a good conversation we're having now because it opens the door for women of Sudan to then see how they can use Maputo protocol um, to demand for those rights as we rebuild. But it's not going to happen if they are not on the table. So if these issues are not in the peace agreement, you don't find them in post-conflict reconstruction because post-conflict reconstruction is directed by the peace agreement. Yeah. So we need something in that peace agreement. And if women are not on the table, we are not getting anything. Like you said, they are just sharing positions. What, what, they are what they might be struggling with is who is going to be the president and who is going to be the vice. That's where, you know, who is going to lead the finance and who is going to do the foreign affairs. And, you know, they, yeah, that's what they're dealing with. And when they get to the table, that's what they discuss. They're discussing power sharing. So they don't see the fact that women have been part of the revolution and that right now in Sudan, without you saying it, the women are the one who are providing. They, they've come in to do the work that, you know, protection work, humanitarian work, receiving people. We are reading those stories of the, the wonderful work that the women's movement is doing in Sudan to enable women to transition, to, to, to pass, you know, the right to passage, to get into safety, you know. So from your story, we see the violation of all the rights in Maputo Protocol, the right to life, the right to safety, the right to uh, freedom of movement, you know, and the dynamics and the challenge we have had to even bring women refugees in Egypt to be here. Because they say, oh, if we travel, we can't come back, we are refugees. And we said African solution to African problems. Yet we are not even thinking about how can these people move as refugees. We get up and we start blaming some Western country. Or the other, the other. Let us start with ourselves. So I want to turn to, to this wonderful audience before I come back to you, all of you. Do you have any questions, reflections, experience? But for you, I'm giving you two minutes. And I'm going to be very hard. After two minutes, I take the microphone. Who is going to help me? So give her that one. If you continue, I just take over from here and I, everybody's hand is up. Okay. We want this to be very participatory. So please keep it two minutes, please. Oh, all right. Thank you. Please mention your name and your organization or, and, and your country. My name is Rodney, and I'm coming from Zimbabwe as a team leader of Women Excel Trust. Uh, thank you for the wonderful contribution. But my question now is, um, after we have noticed and um, identified all the flaws and uh, the lack of implementation and actualization of Maputo Protocol in Africa, what's the way forward? And I have a direct question to... Um, to Catherine, you say that um, we should hold governments to account. What 
which are the governments that you have managed to hold to account from an African level and what were their responses? Thank you. Thank you. I would like to congratulate uh, the panel. Ah. Donc, je voudrais chaleureusement like féliciter le panel, the panel, spécialement ma sœur du Kenya. Nous sommes Kenya. tout cœur avec elle. We, uh, uh, je suis ravi de retrouver quelqu'un que j'ai eu au mois de février à Addis Abeba. I, I Et moi, mon... In, in Addis Abeba, in February, mm. my concern en fait, is à notre sein. Qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire véritablement en tant really que femme? La situation de vulnérabilité des femmes, je pense qu'on a women, entendu des choses and we have dans les zones de pauvreté. Uh, Mais je disais hier que about, uh, nous avons le Gulf protocole de Maputo, qui est un instrument où il y a des acquis. Uh, Mais si nous prenons la 1325, uh, sorry, I didn't introduce myself, Jenny CC. I come from Senegal. Resolution 1325. Now, before that, we have uh, had war in uh, in in uh, Senegal because we we have you had to use 1325 and protocol to really move forward, and, and even if it's a little bit. Women really do not have uh, uh, any margin within which to manipulate things. What has Catherine uh, and other people, what have you done to constrain uh, states uh, to act? Uh, women, because they are vulnerable, have become weapons of war. When we talk about DRC, or Burkina Faso, I, I, I have had girls uh, uh, cry about what happened in South, South Sudan. What can we have uh, as a force uh, so that we can put our voices together? Because concretely on the field, even if we have ratified the Maputo protocol, and we have a way of verifying what is going on, I would like to conclude and saying that uh, those who know war, talk. You know, you know, you know, you know. My my country in, in uh, Senegal, uh, there is no peace, no war, but. Uh, but it, the, the situation is difficult. What can we do about such situations? Good afternoon. My name is Susan Owiro Chege. I'm from Kenya. I work with Partnership for Peace and Security. And uh, I've been implementing UN Security Council Resolution 1325. Uh, my key question is that uh, a lot of these documents are at very high level that uh, to bring them down to the local women is a really big challenge. Right now, we are engaged in the localization of 1325. The second national in the community is that certain practices are helping them uh, do a local action. And I'm finding women at age 50 because they are culture that serenade their sons when they are, circum they are circumcised. These are new th things that are coming. Use this, this force that that culture is outdated. If you are not FGM'd at the time you are supposed to be, why are you doing it at age 50? It is really a challenge. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, once again. Um, my name is Arevide Elizabeth Atieno, and I take this opportunity, first of all, to celebrate someone very special to me and someone very dear to me. Jackie, I'm so, so proud to be associated with you, and you know that. 
and I've got so much love for you and I celebrate you today and I celebrate you every day for being brave and for being able to stand with women who have gone through sexual violence during the post-electioneering period when nobody wanted to look at that. I celebrate you. Clap for her, thank you. Um, I'm just on ventilation mode and uh, with one minute, what with my is it is it still one minute? Okay, thank you, Sawa. So uh, I just want to say, I just want to say, I think in Africa now, time has come for us to stop being technocrats and start being practical. Because everything we're talking about here is so beautiful and so good. But now I want to ask, what this, how do I put it? The stories on the ground are very different. Yani in Kenya, we say, you know, can I see hands up um, from, uh, from uh, of anyone from government here in Kenya? Anyone from government? So we are here speaking to ourselves. It's such a shame. I'm not here to rubbish and thrash my government. I love Kenya, I'm Kenyan. But it's such a pity that you are speaking to ourselves. And this is the mode. This is normally what happens every time. You call after them. And, and, I, and I wonder, what is the need of countries? Catherine, please, educate us. What is the need of countries being signatory to these very good treaties and they do nothing about it? I think up there, there should be a law and a rule that if you are a signatory of any any, uh, you, you are a signatory of, of, of any treaty and you don't implement it, there should either be a penalty or you should withdraw yourself. Because to speak the truth, 16 years later, and Jackie has told you, we are still chasing after government to provide redress to survivors of sexual vi violence. And I stand to be corrected, our very good president happens to be one of the suspects in that case okay. so you have to be so very careful at this point now eh? we will have to stop this way no you have to be very that. careful when you want to speak about that <laughs> and i stand to be correct and understand here to speak this is one of the reasons as to why so much is happening in our countries women are dying women are suffering children are dying and nobody wants to speak about it because the high and the mighty are the ones involved thank you so much very clear, very clear. The message is what? Very clear, and we can hear you. And so, thank you. so, yes. so. <laughs> I want to protect Catherine. I want to protect Catherine. Yes. Any questions again? Please, can you go to others? Eh? We have okay. one, two, three, four, five plus me. I know that we have problems, but I think all the questions are coming and she'll be asking herself now, why did Helen bring me here mm -hmm. now? I'm not saying we shouldn't question, please let's question, but it's not looking a bit like she's taking on. Please, I want to protect her, please. Thank you so much, my sisters. She's also involved in the African Human Rights Commission. Why are we not asking her? <laughs> Me, I'm also G Markin. Why are you not asking me? Hey, leave Catherine. She has like seven questions already. Otherwise, she will take over the event from us. So, okay. Yes, sister. Okay. Thank you very much. I, I won't take long because you've actually um, came in, you know, to really de delimit some of these issues that we're going to say. But I've just learned something that, you know, uh, my name is Colette Litujani. I'm sorry, I'm from South Africa. I work for the Human Rights Institute of South Africa. And we are also part uh, of a committee that is working with government. We assisted them develop national action plan on women, peace and security. So what I wanted to say is that, uh, I think uh, Catherine's, uh, I mean, uh, the person we are defending here is that we all need to learn, we have learned something that as we are working in our communities, in our organization, one of us 
could be burdened, you know, could be suffering by some of the traumatic uh, experiences. Because we had someone like that who wasn't talking until they crashed. Okay, so that was something that I say, let us take it that it is not longer a story of that person I don't know. It does not happen to me. It's such a perfect thing. And then I wanted to discuss issues of access to justice, which Maputo Protocol is highlighting the two of you that um, access to justice uh, in that provision, it says that women must access uh, legal services. There must be free lawyers, for example, to assist women to bring cases. We see that uh, that is not taking place. And then also interpretation, uh, at, I think Article 27, where it says that the African court is a court with the uh, power to make interpretations and lit we can bring cases. Most of us here, our countries have not signed a declaration giving us direct access to the African court, meaning access to justice is impeded because at national level, here is the case, we know nothing has happened. You jump to the region, you go to the African court and there's no access to justice. How do we do that? Thank you very much. Okay, so before you speak, my sister, I want to take one hand online. Um, I see a hand online. Can you ask your question, please? Go ahead. Yeah. Good afternoon, ladies. Before, let me confirm. Can you hear us? Yes. Yes, go ahead. My name is Claire Osoro. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge Jackie for sharing her story and confirming that we as women can also hold our hands and support each other through processes, especially legal, acknowledging that in as much as we share this as stories, it's a confirmation that if you do follow due process, it can actually come to reward you at a point in time. You stand to represent so many voices you do not know, but I salute you, Jackie. Um, secondly, for me, I would like to pose this more of as a challenge than a question. As we celebrate Maputo at 20, what are we doing at grassroots level? Are we having coinciding events as partners, as organizations to educate, to inform the grassroots women on the, um, on the articles, educate them on their rights, educate them on what or where they would get access to help, for example, if some or any of these rights are to be um, defiled or violated? And are we documenting this? Because it would be important, even as we uh, dance and celebrate and um, gather in a room and all that, to just know as organizations that there's coinciding events that are going on on the ground and women who are unaware of what is happening this week are educated and informed so that probably by next year or the next event as we mark it, we acknowledge and document that this was our input as organizations, as parties, as partners. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that uh, input. One, one minute. Uh, how many hands do I have still up? I want to count now. Number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Six, seven. That's the end. One, one minute. Seven minutes, we are done, we are moving. Yes. Thank you very I've much. Uh, my name is Azabib Musaloro. I'm the ED for Women for Justice and Equality, South Sudan. Um, first of all, appreciate the panelists. And that one thing that I want to ask is that we have rumors of elections in South Sudan. So there is that, that tension that at times one feels the fear of the unknown. And we already know that some people have started campaigning, yet blocking others from campaigning. So some of us can predict what the outcome will be. What can we learn from the Kenyan experience? And maybe if another person has an experience of a different place of how we can 
counteract the situation. Thank you. Well, the Maputo protocol to me as an activist is one that um, it's going to help us on, um, cause if we talk about political will, that political will is something that the whole region has to help us, you know, to gain. But how do we do it? How do we do it differently? Yeah, so this is, thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Michael. I come from South Sudan. I work with Active Citizen as Executive Director of South Sudan. Uh, the point I wanted to bring here is not more of a, a question, but a, a comment over what we are discussing. I'm so much moved by all that was dis uh, said by the funnels, especially my sister from South Sudan who did say, uh, property cannot own property. So, so that's a very strong statement and something need to, to, to be done about that. So what I would wanted to suggest here to all the members coming across uh, the African continent is that when it comes to campaign, what matters is numbers. So uh, I would want to concur with the colleagues who did say it earlier, that we need to take this campaign down to the grassroots. The more we make noise, the more other people will listen, including the government. So if we make more noise and there are so many people making noise about the same, that we need women to have the right, we need equality in leaderships, in social uh, aspect, legal and economic aspect, noise will be heard. If people make noise here, we can move out of this building. But if we make if we don't make noise, people will stand uh, to dominate uh, the throne mm. because it is a good place. Okay. Until you you claim your right, it is only when uh, we will be heard. Thank so you. So let's take it down to the to grassroots, the grassroots, and then okay. will then it will influence the one minute over. Maker. Thank you. Number three, one minute. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Je vais parler en français. Je suis Nathalie Foucault. I'm going to speak de l'association Women Peace Foucault Initiative and, uh, qui Initiative est au Cameroun. Uh, je voudrais dire ici I would que like to say uh, quand ma soeur my de, sister de Sudan, from uh, South uh, Sudan was speaking, uh, I immediately Cameroun, saw Cameroon uh, in what she was saying. I saw the suffering of uh, women at home, especially in, in the con context of conflicts uh, in the north uh, of Cameroon uh, and in the southwest uh, between, uh, and also the Anglophone conflict with Seleka, especially uh, with regard to DRC. In the past, we have tried to to, to implement a prevent, prevention, but uh, we have uh, felt that we are not understood. We have tried to put forward our proposals, uh, but uh, unfortunately, this has not been carried out well. In Cameroon, we have uh, between uh, more than uh, 55 women uh, who are killed. So many of them have been uh, uh, killed, and we keep hearing about uh, this, 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 this matters in the, in, the, in the news. This has been so rampant and has been increasing. It is really becoming uh, very desperate. I would like to know, considering that uh, we can see that there is a lot of conflict in Africa and many countries are in conflict, my question would be to know, how can we find the root causes of these different conflicts? For me, we need to find uh, the, 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 the intersection between all these uh, conflicts. How can we use the Maputo Protocol to, to seek solutions uh, and even address the root causes of the conflicts and bring solutions uh, in Africa. The way I see things is, 
this is a there's a problem of politics in Africa. I would like to thank you. Thank you very much. Number four behind you. I'm going to speak in, fr in, in, in French. I'm Tatiana, uh, coming from RDC. Uh, talking about uh, sexual violence and, and uh, what uh, Jackie said. Uh, thank you very much, Jackie. Uh, today we are celebrating 20 years uh, Makut uh, Protocol. Uh, I was uh, 20 years ago, I was 20 years old. I was uh, 19 years. I, I did not get any justice. Nobody helped me to come out of the sexual problem. How are we uh, going to talk about these issues? Uh, how we can bring forth the countries that ratify the Maputo protocol to respond and on this protocol and the visibility? Is it uh, possible? I think uh, we need to go at one time uh, to work uh, to see that this happens and uh, the articles are taken into account. Thank you. Okay. Merci. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think. Uh, uh, well, uh, in reality, I wanted to intervene. Uh, I don't even remember the name of that person. We are talking about implementation of the. We are talking about implementation. Uh, what, what are we doing as uh, participants that uh, this implementation takes place? I would like also if we have sisters here who are coming from uh, South Africa. Africa, uh, I know very well there was a, a protocol that uh, I believe, uh, or maybe an act uh, in the sub region, which uh, is more of um, the Maputo protocol uh, putting in place or targeting uh, to be realized. Could they share their experience? Has it brought any changes to their country so that we can um, draw parallel and borrow from them? Uh, we get something uh, additional to help us uh, uh, arrive at the conclusion of Maputo Protocol. If that person can come and talk about it, I believe uh, the implementation. Uh, always uh, is linked to the mental capacity of the lady in the rural areas. Do we um, help them? Do we uh, help them to talk for themselves? Uh, capacity building at that level? Because there are so many actions, so many conventions, uh, which we need to have proper policies uh, to get uh, clear change, uh, just to add a little additional issues that can help us in implementation of this protocol. It is us who are called to work with others so that we have the proper mechanism for the implementation of the protocol. Thank you very much, Madam Kwasafui. Yeah. Please introduce yourself, your name, organization. Uh, my name is Mohammed Bilal Mir from Silver Crescent Community Based Organization. We are based in Kajado County. I am a SGBV champion, a mental health champion, and a menstrual champion. I have been working for over a decade and a half in Kajado. I would start off by acknowledging, saluting, and appreciating Madam Jackie for taking courage for sharing her firsthand experience of hardship, misery, difficulty in this age and century. All mankind are limbs of the same tree.
When by hard times one limb is put to test, the rest are made restless and depressed. This is a quote that is on the placard of the United Nations. When humanity somewhere suffers, it's a sufferation for global humanity. I like to quote Mahatma Gandhi saying, live the change you want to see in the world. In front of me, I am seeing a room filled with ladies and gentlemen alike that are living the change they believe. Mine is not more of a question, but more of a comment. We have started addressing the elephant or elephants in the room in a global forum and a space like this. I would request and suggest more and more such forums. And as many people, if each one of us in this room goes and talks to 10 of their friends to come to this kind of forums, we will be a voice, a tsunami of some sort to bring change. I, as a male, feel that ladies are equal partners to us. Without them, the world would be a gloomy place to be. They are our mothers, our sisters, our daughters, our friends, wives. Let us appreciate them and let us ripple these conversations in every space we get an opportunity to. For the panelists, for those of you who invited me here, I am honored and thankful. Thank you so much. And I would like to be uh, really appreciateful for more such conversations in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our he for she. Thank you. And finally, number seven, one minute. <laughs> We've appreciated the panelists. We have appreciated them. Just go to the question. Oh, the panelists already appreciated them. Yes. That one finished. <laughs> My name is Mrs. H. I'm lovely Nenna, I'm a Nigerian chair women to Kili. First of all, it's very, very important that we not just say all these things here and wait for another meeting time. Let's find a way of making sure that all the organizations that have like minds get themselves together. Plan, the world is too small now. Plan a WhatsApp group, Google Meet, things like that, so that we ginger this every day. Because the song you hear every day, you cram in your head. And if we don't do it, it will be like Jamboree. We'll still come again another day. We still do our Jamboree. We go, we say that the government is not doing this, is not doing that. When a little child disturb you for biscuits and you don't want to buy it, you borrow money and buy it. <laughs> so let's do that same method towards the government. Let's sing it as a song. When they are passing on the street, they are hearing it. When they are driving, they are hearing it. When they are looking at the traffic light, they are hearing it. It will become part of them. They will have no option but to listen. Thank you. <laughs> so we are beginning to address the elephants in the room, but some of the elephants are still not here. <laughs> That's what my sister is saying. Let's stop talking to ourselves. But sometimes it's good we talk to ourselves. You heard what my sister said. Let us mobilize. I want you to put on your bulletproof vest <laughs> and don't blame us. It's not every time we have somebody from WPS uh, AU that, uh, that can tell us what we can do. So there have been a lot of questions around implementation, accountability, uh, the process, you know, what people are signatories. They are not doing anything. AU is just collecting reports. And then what? accountability. I know you have noted the questions, but I want you to try as much as you can in two minutes. Two minutes, sisters and brothers. Eh? Two minutes, because we said this conversation, we continue. My sister said the world is very small. 
So tomorrow, Osfam has to bring us back. That conversation in that hotel, let's continue. So me, I, I trust there must be something after this. What can you, what can we do as African women to ensure the implementation of the women, peace and security agenda? How do we hold governments accountable? You've shown us the similarities between Maputo protocol and the WPS framework. Practically, with you now here looking at us, what can we do? Because we need to shift these boundaries that we are seeing blocking us. Over to you. In two minutes, I know you can do it. Yeah, thank you, Helen. But allow me to first acknowledge Jackie. I met her in 2012 at the Gender Commission. She was very thin and uh, very bad looking. Actually, today I told her, hey, you've really changed. Right? So that story is as it is. And it's a story and I want to congratulate you. She came up with a movement that is now supporting other women. And her story is many, many stories of many African women in many, many, many countries. And it always saddens me when I hear those things, but congratulations is a battle and we move on. Coming back to your question, you know, it's a very big question. I don't have the full answer, but the answer lies with the civil society. The civil society brought the Maputo protocol into the AU. From 1995, when the Maputo Protocol was conceived until 2000, is the women civil society who made it happen. The same with the resolution 1325. It was brought from as early as uh, 1979, is when the issues of women, peace, and security, by then it was women in conflict situations, started being discussed at the uh, the women, uh, CSW, the Commission on the Status of Women. And it kept moving back. The Secretary General asking, go do a report, go do research, go do consultations. And finally, in 2000, with the um, Namibia on the seat of the President for the UN Security Council, the 1325 was passed. So what am I saying? That the civil society with the power to go to our governments, having done our research, having done these consultations, to tell them, hey, you've said one, two, three, you are doing nothing. Can we start having a collaboration that is not to critique from a negative point of view, but from areas telling them what they are done well, what they are not doing well, and what we can do, because also civil society has a lot of capability to fundraise for some of the rights. So I think that the, 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 the answer lies back to us. And uh, when I was in Kenya, the Gender Commission, one civil society came coming always asking for the women's hotline. and. Until the PS sat with Ali, she said the following day, we are going to launch it. She was actively advocating. So let's provide platforms to dialogue, to advocate positively. Governments don't like being critiqued. Don't go tell them we are not doing, we are not doing it. So you'll be surprised they do not know all these provisions. How many even of us do we know the articles of the protocol here? So how do we expect them to do what they don't know? How do we expect them to put money to things they don't know? So it's us again to take the responsibility, uh, understand, go to them, and also fundraise and do it together. And I've seen it happen in some countries, and I think that is what we can do. But of course, we need to raise awareness at all levels, the grassroots, the policymakers, and for civil society to work together. Let's not work in silos. Helen, I don't know whether I've responded well. You have. My problem <laughs> is that you're passing the thing back to us. You yes, know. because again, and just to reiterate, when you look at the Maputo Protocol, it only asks government to say what policies and legal frameworks it has done. Yeah, I mean, I receive all these reports, and every country has a law on gender-based violence, has a law on gender, as a policy or not. So the government has done its part. Policy, but they're not policy. implementing. But now implementation is the, mm. the issue. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Hannah. African Human Rights Commission, what can we do from your experience? Do we have any windows of opportunities to uh, engage with the commission on these rights? Please uh, advise us. There are windows of opportunity because some of these issues, we've already raised them at the level of the commission during the NGO forum. My colleague uh, Colette can confirm that we've been able to get some resolutions uh, from the forum that we have shared with the African Commission. Now the next stage will be pushing those issues, continuing to push those issues. Because once we continue pushing them, 
making sure that the chairperson and the mechanism are working together on those issues. I think we will make a, a headway. But before I conclude, I have a little thing that I wanted to say. Yes, somebody talked about terrorism, fundamentalism, war here and there. Does Africa manufacture arms? Then how come that Africa is the place that they come to deposit all those arms for us to be killing ourselves? And why are we allowing it? You know, we have to ask, uh, yes, why should we allow them to give us arms to be killing each other? What's the men what kind of mentality do you call that? I think we, we need a civil society to find out the um, budget of defense and try to ensure that it responds to the need development needs of men in their country rather than put it in go and buy arms, which they will end up killing themselves. Mm -hmm. People don't have food to eat. And yet, government is ready to buy arms. Mm. And we are keeping quiet. And when you do keep quiet, they say that you are an accomplice after the fact. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anna. Jacqueline, we have celebrated you for your resilience, for your agency, for your sisterhood, for your solidarity for your strength and for being that, 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 that foundation for other women to speak and demand for justice. From your experience, what can you say to our sisters in South Sudan? You had her, you had her. Elections, we hear. I like the time she used, we hear. Because tomorrow we can be given a decree. Eh? Degree number, blah, 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 those languages of theirs. No elections until further notice. We say, okay, sir, well done. But in, the, in case it happens, in case it is going to happen, what do you think we should do to prevent election-related violence in South Sudan? Any hope with Maputo? Okay. Thank one minute, my sister. I know I love you, but okay. one minute. <laughs> and it was really just one of my answers that I was going to share. And um, it was based on basically trying to implement protection laws, is ensuring that you implement the, the laws and, and try to deal with the, any delays in the, in the development of the same or the implementation of the same. And then ensure sufficient budgetary allocations for contingency planning, because that's what you are going to need. Then there's um, availability of post-trip care services and supplies in all the institutions. Um, you need resources to train clinicians, and especially in things like uh, the rights of survivor participations in documentation of sexual violence in conflict, you will need that, and also establish um, uh, uh, shelters because you will need that where women are going, women and children are going to, to take refuge. But above all that. What Kenya did in 2022 was develop something called the Electoral Security um, Program. It was a specialized program where all government agencies came together and, and uh, developed a plan, a response plan. So the police were part of that committee. The election um, body was part of that committee. Um, uh, interior and security were part of it. The local administration were part of it. There were structures from the top to the bottom all of them implementing this plan. So just in case this happens, what was going to be the response? And they went to even the extent of actually coming up with, with um, response things. For, for example, if a fire breaks out, what, what, what happens then? Yes, yeah, there were command centers. Exactly. Thank you, my sister. There were command centers that were established. It was quite an elaborate, elaborate plan, but it worked to from the violence of 207, where over 6,000 women were raped, women and um, men and women survivors, um, people were violated. To 2017, where there were uh, to 2017, where they recorded the Kenya National Commission for Human Rights recorded 200. This time, it was less than I think 100 people who were reported violated. So that's what you need to do in South Sudan. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank what, you so much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Can I just make my final recommendations to AU? Okay. Yes, please. Go ahead. My my recommendations to AU is um the con the continent is always in conflict. 
So one of the things that uh, we need to do, first of all, is about a need for a clause on women human rights defenders. There is nothing that it speaks about human women human rights defenders and anything specific about how, how to respond to them, responding to their needs, responding to their protection needs specifically, which is covered by the, by the protocol. Um, and there's also a need for clause on the reparations for sexual violence. There's nothing whatsoever about reparations in, in any of the documents. They do not address that. It's all very, uh, very practical policy making, but the reality is that needs happen after in post-conflict post and reconstruction. You need reparations, and Thank that you. should be an agenda. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for raising the issues of women human rights defenders. So, um, you want <laughs> Anna? Was yeah? Please let her. Um, we also have assignments. Yeah, we should also have assignments, and uh, some of these uh, have become resolutions at the level of the commission, but we've not made it our business to follow up in terms of implementing. We don't even make it our business. Look, what does it provide for? So it should be our business to look at those resolutions to see how we can breathe, breathe life. Because most of those uh, resolutions have an anchor either in the African Charter or in the Protocol on the Rights of Women. Okay. So it is our business to sit, even if it means taking one hour every day and looking at them and checking where in terms of implementation, Okay. you should be able to interpret and make sure you get a headway. So we need to do an analysis, That's right. actually, and identify those points. So we are, we are making recommendations now. Josephine. Sudan. 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 No, no, I'm saying, I want to ask you a question, but I'm saying Sudan is in conflict. Sudan doesn't have Maputo protocol. Josephine, what would you advise in terms of your experience of the Maputo protocol, what do you think they can do and take advantage? You know, we are saying we can take advantage of the conflict. How do we take advantage of this conflict to bring in and slot in 1325, slot in Maputo protocol before the men wake up from sharing their powers? <laughs> um, I think the time is now. Don't wait for another minute. The time is now ensure that the women who are seated at the table have these provisions included in the peace agreement. And if they are included, and then they will be implemented. That is my advice. But I have last words to say. I'm looking at the, the Africa that we want and the South Sudan that we want and the Kenya that we want with children born out of rape. They are stateless. They don't have fathers. Is that the Africa that we want? Is that the South Sudan that we want? Moving forward, I am happy Jack is here. We also came with some survivors from South Sudan who have been affected, who have gone through sexual violence. Survivors need to stand up. Emma, um, Hannah Foster yesterday but one said that she is not going to speak for them anymore. She's not going to speak for them anymore. So we are not going to speak for you anymore because don't believe in us, believe in you. Way forward, we are going to, how do we implement Maputo protocol at the grassroots? We are going to go with survivors. We are very aware that survivors need protection. Catherine talked about that protection. As, as our role is to ensure that protection is guaranteed and with that survivors will get out. Survivors in South Sudan have formed survivor networks at state level, at national level. They are spreading out. It is a time bomb. <laughs> the bomb is finally bursting out from different countries and when survivors bust out, you'll find that Africa will bust out and leaders will begin to listen. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Powerful, Jessica. Yes. Can I just say one thing that we, just, just one thing it's about survivors. Sisters. What can I do? We, we, what Grace Agenda believes in is self-agency. Yes. Memorialization and, uh, and, uh, and reparations for sexual violence. In Africa here, we have got um, something called the SEMA network. Mm. SEMA means speak. And it was initiated by the, the Dennis Mukwege Foundation. I am a member, mm -hmm. Tatiana is a member, 
And I think we also have some from South Sudan also who are mm. powerful members. Members, and that is the voice actually that is now speaking on the grassroots. That agency is what makes me sit on this panel. God yes. bless you. We are going to take over this panel tonight. It belongs to women. Sister, we are so happy to have you with us. We are very sorry about everything that is happening in Sudan. I wish we could do better as African women uh, in terms of collective action, but in terms of supporting our sisters. But at least speaking to you gives us some kind of courage that we can connect. Tell us, all of us here, what can we do? Right now, forget about Maputo Protocol and WPS, forget. Right now, what do you want us as African women to do for the women of Sudan? Don't fear, say it the way you want. Say it. <laughs> yeah, um, actually, I'm just recognizing, as I said, because the discussion for me, it's a start now. We've been isolated because I felt at some extent you are sharing experience that we was not part of it. You are sharing the same stories. I can relate to your story, but not your experience. And that exactly what I need. And actually, I mean, speaking, I'm trying to represent it, the Sudanese women voices because we are in the same situation. I can relate to each single story. When Jacqueline talk about the story, she give life to all the numbers that I state. My previous talk about the conflict, about the number. So we are talking about different stories in her voice. So for me, it's Sudanese women are doing effort since ever, since like when we started fighting for our independence in 1952. And in, I can imagine the journey that we are not being recognized till now, till that moment. So it means that we really need to do something different. And I look at it as the networking with our sisters in Africa, and we need to be more open to our regional solution rather than the international solution. For me, even like I was just thinking and have this inner talk in my head about why people in Sudan are so familiar with Sidao and not even know about the Maputo protocol. It's really devastating. Even for me, myself, I think I'm talking even about myself. I'm not excluding myself from it, but I'm glad that conversation is a start and I'm being part of it. And I think right now, during this time in the conflict time, Sudanese women in need for the support of the regional organization, the women who have been sharing the same agenda, the same pain actually, and the same experience to put together their work and work collectively toward the Africa we looking forward to. Wow. As we conclude, I want to thank you so much. I know there are so many things happening outside. Some people have left, but you have stayed here to the end. And it means so much to us. There are many things we need to go away with. And I said, those things exist, but we are not reading. We are not analyzing. We are not positioning ourselves within those frameworks. So they are there, but we are not using it. We need to do more around that area. We need to show solidarity with our sisters in Sudan. We need to speak on their behalf. We need to campaign against sexual violence, against women going on in Sudan. Uh, you remember uh, Eyes on Sud South Sudan? <laughs> you remember that our campaign? We need a campaign like that for Sudan, where we are all speaking for them. I want to thank you all, my sisters. I want to say to us fam that we need this to be the beginning of a journey. A journey for collective action on bringing WPS and Maputo together, on holding our governments accountable, on journey with our sisters in conflict, pushing behind the scenes and supporting our sisters to get those issues into the agreement and giving them technical support. That's what it took to get those things for South Sudan. So we are going to be learning from ourselves. There's one question that was not answered from Cameroon. How can we find the, the, the root causes 
of conflict in Africa. There, there are lots of uh, researches on that. And I can tell you, one of them is leaders who refuse to leave power, like my uncle in your country. <laughs> you guys, this room. <laughs> The other is marginalization. The other is the lack of equal distribution of resources. So people feel marginalized, they go into uh, rebel groups and they begin to destabilize countries. The other is our brothers on the other side eh, who are benefiting from giving us arms. Yeah. Those ones? The other is our brothers also who are receiving and who are also holding on to power eh? and using patriarchy and all the systems and structures to, to, to deal with us as women. A property does not own property, my brother from South Sudan. We need to continue, my Nous sister, continuer, ma soeur, that we take this conversation strategically que, pour que through the African Union. Through the human rights stratégique for peace and security in Africa, I always say, how can en faveur de la paix et la sécurité? Je me demande toujours comment est-ce que les les femmes peuvent arrêter la guerre? Il nous faut une force contre la guerre dirigée par les femmes. Il nous faut un mouvement qui est composé de femmes. Je ne parle pas d'une d'un mouvement militarisé. Nous allons partir avec nos mamans et avec notre pouvoir souple, avec nos larmes, notre dignité en tant que femme, nous allons l'utiliser. Nous allons utiliser nos corps pour arrêter la guerre. Mais il faut faire preuve de courage. Nous devons être courageuses pour faire face au patriarcat, le démanteler et tous les mots. Euh, They are here, they are here. But these are not the ones causing the problem. The ones here are already on our side. <laughs> he has agreed with me. So we need to bring the men to the table, but we should never be afraid to confront patriarchy and say truth to power. That my sister was just trying to pull her down. Eh? She was going to raise this roof. Eh? <laughs> the way she was angry. But we need that level of anger for change to happen. So thank you so much. I have enjoyed this conversation. It's been a lovely evening. I thought I'll be tired, but I feel so energized. Jackie, thank you. Josephine, thank you. Catherine and my sister from Sudan and Hannah Foster. Thank you so much. And thank you, my sisters. Have a lovely evening. Mm -hmm.